All right, guys. So in this video, I'm going to be talking you through the four filmmaker theories that you need to be aware of before you study stories we tell. This, um, these theories are really important because it's likely that you could get a specific question in the exam that asks you about key documentary theories. Um, so we're going to look at four theories in total, and then what we'll do. All I'm going to do today is just go through what the basic theories actually mean, and then uh, we'll spend a bit of time in class applying them to stories we tell to see. Uh, to what extent they can be applied to stories we tell at all, if, if they can at all, and also how look at these theories might change the way that we understand the film. So a little text at the bottom says, stories we tell need to be explored in relation to key filmmaker theories and to what extent the film directly embodies aspects of the theories or, in some cases, how they might challenge them. It might be that some aspects of the theories do relate to the film, but some don't. Um, what I will say with these theories, though, they're not specifically theories per se. They are a lot of them are more about a style of filmmaking or a particular approach that a filmmaker might take. So that's certainly apparent for, to be honest, probably three out of the four theories we need to look at. To be honest, only one of them has an actual, you know, what you know as a theory specifically. So. Uh, these are the four filmmakers we're going to be looking at. So we've got Michael Moore from America, Nick Broomfield, uh, Peter Watkins and Kim, I'm not sure he's Longinotto or Longinotto from the UK. Um, so each of these uh, four filmmakers are the ones that we need to be aware of um, in case the question on theories comes up in the exam. So we'll start off with Michael Moore. This is Michael Moore here. Uh, he's an American documentary filmmaker. Um, he is a bit of a background about his style. Politically, he is very, very, very left wing. He's probably someone who would describe himself as a socialist. Um, maybe that might be a bit debatable, to be honest. But he certainly is very left wing and he's very anti-conservative. Um, the right wing of America absolutely hate him and his documentaries are often kind of the kind of documentaries that attack certain belief systems or certain institutions certain people maybe um specifically people in u.s culture as well his he made quite a lot of documentary films well, he's not made any for a while. I think his last one that he directed himself was in 2018. So he's not done any for a while. Um, but his most famous film is probably Bowling for Columbine. This is the one that you might have seen if you've seen any of Michael Morrison's. I think it's on Sky, I think. Pretty sure it is. Um, and this one specifically is about gun control. But you can see here from the list of films that he's made, there are a lot of different institutions that he chooses to attack in the films that he makes. So you've got Roger. Oops, let's give it that. Roger and Me, which is globalization, unemployment, Bowling for Columbine, as I already mentioned, which is the focus on gun control and the NRA, which is the National Rifle Association. Uh, you've got these two films that are sort of like, um, you know, have a lot in common. You've got Fahrenheit 9-11 and Fahrenheit 11-9. Fahrenheit 9-11 is about the election of George W. Bush in 2000, 2000 I think it was. It's something about 2000 or 2001. Um, and how it led to the Iraq War. Whereas Fahrenheit 11.9, which is sort of a um, sort of a sequel, but not really also a sequel, uh, is specifically about Trump. Um, you've also got Sicko, which is on private health care and Capitalism, a love story, which is on the financial crash of 2008, which was on Netflix, but I don't know if it still is. Uh, these are all worth watching. Um, he is very, uh, what's the word, quite heavily involved in the topics that he gets himself involved in. Um, and he, he's a quite an entertaining style of documentary filmmaking. So like I've just said there, um, he used a lot of comedy and satire to attack the institutions that he has targeted. So it is quite tongue in cheek, but it has a very serious tone behind it. Um, this bit is also quite important as well. He is an active participant in the films that he makes. So he's not just a voice off screen that's asking questions or a voiceover narrator. He is someone who is there getting involved, talking to people, going to see places, um, you know, setting up all the different scenes. He, he, whilst he's not necessarily seen directly involved in the filmmaking process, he is central to the quote unquote narrative of the film films that he makes. <laughs> Um, he does try and make himself paint the savant to be an everyday 
person. He's very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He presents himself as being someone who's relatable, someone who is a man of the people. I mean, look at the mise en scène that he is wearing here. You know, he's carrying the American flag, so obviously he's got that sense of patriotism. He's got a cap on, his sunglasses. You know, he's got quite a scruffy, I say scruffy, scruffy casual appearance. He's a little bit overweight as well, but that's all deliberate choice. You know, Moore does this because he wants to feel less threatening to the people who he's trying to interview. Because they're, they're often people who are slippery. You know, people who might try and pull the wool over your eyes. So he comes across relatable, harmless, a little bit bumbling in a way. But then that's a deliberate choice to disarm them before he goes in with a quite a serious line of questions so one of the one of his key sequences from Bolden for Columbine is where he goes to visit a bank that is giving a free gun to anyone who takes out a bank account in that bank and he goes through the process signs all the forms he, he you know asks how to spell the word Caucasian things like that and then once he gets his hands on the gun he then goes straight into his line of questions saying do you not think it's a bit dangerous to hang the gun out in the bank it's quite a good sequence you can find on YouTube I'd recommend checking it out so um, his films, I've already mentioned this, his films are, they have strong beliefs, all right? They are polemical and subjective as well. They're very much his beliefs. They are subjects that are, you know, important to him. You know, they're ones that have maybe, maybe even has some sort of personal involvement in that subject. So, for example, for Bowling for Columbine, um, the main the like event that, that triggered this was the Columbine High School Massacre. Um, and there is some relationship, I can't remember what's about what the relationship is, with Flint, Michigan in the film. And that's where Michael Moore is from. Uh, the same with Capitalism, a love story as well. I can't remember what's but there's some relationship in the town that he is from. So they are, they're very personal to him. Um, and he uses that in quite a light-hearted, but also quite, a pitying way as well. Um, he will often use montages of found footage. Uh, they do tend to be quite ironic as well. So again, one of his famous sequences from Bowling for Columbine is where he has a montage of a number of different alleged atrocities committed by the US government whilst juxtaposed with the, with the soundtrack of What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong. So it's did a bit meant to be quite an ironic montage juxtaposing the shocking sequences with the upbeat song um he also uses performative documentary as well which we're going to come back to in a little bit because this, this isn't one of the theories that you need to look at but it's certainly a key one that is very 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 relevant to both michael moore and nick broomfield as well but also stories we tell so this is nick broomfield very happy looking guy here with his boom mic and his uh, his audio recording equipment um his style is quite similar to michael moore um but he, one of the, he does often tend to make films about political issues, but he's probably more well known for making films about not, notable figures, usually entertainers or celebrities, but not not universally. So one of his most famous documentaries, this one here, Biggie and Tupac, which is on the the whole rivalry and and murder of uh, Tupac. Shakur and Biggie Smalls. That's a really good one. That's worth watching. But he also did this one in 2003, Eileen, Life and Death of a Serial Killer, which is about the serial killer Eileen Warnos. Um, that's that was a really groundbreaking documentary. He actually interviewed Eileen Warnos, and did they did strike up some sort of weird I don't know to say friendship, but some weird connection between the two, which makes it it's a really interesting documentary. Um, Whitney Houston or Whitney Can I Be Me, which is one of his most recent ones as well. Um, one of the things that that, that that's differs Nick Broomfield uh, from Michael Moore is whilst Michael Moore is still a participant in the documentary, Nick Broomfield himself is a bit more of an active participant in the sense that he's actually involved in the filmmaking process as well. So you can see here, he's got equipment with his boom mic, his headphones and his audio recording equipment here. He records the audio. So he is he is also participating in the production of the documentary as well. Um, one of the things you'd certainly say about Nick Broomfield's style is he is very much the person who influenced Louis Theroux. Uh, Louis Theroux basically ripped off his, his entire shtick, to be honest, because whilst Michael Moore 
when we spoke about here trying to be an everyday relatable person to disarm his opponents, uh, his opponents, sorry, his, his subjects, um, Broomfield does something similar, whereas he presents himself as a bumbling, harmless English, you know, threatless, relaxed individual. And again, it's all to disarm the subject matter. And he's he, he he's very very successful. This I mean one of the one of the famous interviews he does in um, Biggie and Tupac is with one of the people who is alleged to be one of the people who murdered. I think I remember it was Tupac or Biggie Smalls, one of them. Uh, and this guy is an absolute unit. He goes into a prison you know, surrounded by all these inmates talking to this guy who is an absolute wardrobe of a guy and just completely is not afraid to ask him these questions about the allegations. But because he ha- he presents himself as this harmless, English, quaint, small man, he gets some really interesting results because people are, are not threatened by him. I mean, Louis Theroux does a similar sort of thing. But Nick Broomfield saw did it first. Um, Louis Theroux has admitted he was massively influenced by Nick Broomfield. And this is from a couple of years ago where Nick, uh, Louis Theroux interviewed Nick Broomfield at Doc Fest in Sheffield. Um, but this is quite impossible because it because he comes across as being innocent and harmless. He probably can get himself into situations where most people wouldn't, wouldn't ever get because he is meant to be, you know, harmless and trustworthy in a way. You know, he's likable. Um, this is a good little quote here. So this is why he decides to use that participatory approach. So he says, what's important is the interaction between the filmmakers and those being filmed and that the audience is aware of that interaction so they can make the decisions on their own. So that's a good little quote there that explains why Broomfield does the way he does. So I think he probably imagines that this style can help make his interactions much more authentic you know, much more real, much more conversational. And that allows the spectator to you know, get a more accurate depiction of what it is that's being presented with. Um, so these are two things that Broomfield and Michael Moore have in common. Like we said, we've already spoke about how they're both politically left wing. Uh, they both use participatory style. So Michael Moore is the, he's not a presenter, but he is the active participant on screen. Whereas Broomfield is the same thing, but he's also operating the sound boom as well. Uh, we also, this is quite a good bit as well. We are also very aware that there is a documentary crew that is filming at the same time. We don't see that as much with Michael Moore, but we do with Nick Broomfield. So he's very uh, breaking the fourth wall, very postmodern in a way. They're both casual, non-threatening, everyman persona, and they use that to challenge the authority figures. So whilst their subjects might be quite different-ish, um, they have very, very similar styles. So this is a really important theory to make a note of as well. It's not one of the key ones that we need to look at, but it's called performative documentary. Now, this is really important because both Broomfield and Moore and stories we tell use performative documentary techniques. Now, what this is, this is a really important thing because this is it's quite postmodern, quite self-reflective, quite self-aware. Because as it says in the second bullet point here, this openly invo- this involves openly acknowledging that the intrusion of the filmmaker into the situation being filmed inevitably affects and alters that situation. So what that basically means is it's the idea that a camera or a film crew instantly changes what it is that you are filming because the subjects are aware that they are being filmed so it's the whole argument of is that is what's being filmed actually true or not because having a camera pointed in someone's face having a boom mic hanging over your head you know is going to change the way people might act in that particular situation so it all comes back to the idea of documentary truth and both michael moore and nick broomfield are essentially making a point of that and they? they're openly acknowledging the fact that by having this film crew here, by having this performative documentary techniques, that's going to change reality. Because as soon as you point a microphone in someone's face, as soon as you point a camera in someone's face, you know, that's arguably going to 
create less of a sense of reality and more of a sense of artificiality because it's not natural. So this is a good thing here. So it underlines the fact that documentary itself is a mode of representation as opposed to unmediated reality and thus foregrounds the construction and artificiality of even non-fiction films. So what it's saying there is how can we ever know if these films are real or not? Or truth in quotation marks. Uh, this is not to imply that such documentaries are not concerned with getting at the truth, but rather that the truth emerges from the encounter between the filmmakers, subjects and spectators. That's a quite interesting thing as well. So performative documentary, really important for both Broomfield, Moore and Stories We Tell as well, which we'll come back to when we start looking at that in a bit more in class. Skip past that, we'll come back to that afterwards. Right, so this is the second theory we've got to look at. Sorry, third one, which is Kim Longinotto. Um, she is a British filmmaker. Um, now, her style is very different to, um, what they call The Goblin Ed. Broomfield and Michael Moore. Um, she describes herself as an observational filmmaker. So these are some of the films that she's made. Sin Sinjuko Boys, uh, which is about tr a small trans community in Japan somewhere. Uh, Divorce Iranian style. Sisters in Law is actually on the spec, I think. Pretty sure it is anyway. Uh, and these are the ones as well. But we only really need to know about her theories. So this is a good little quote to start off with. So it says, I don't think of films as documents or records of things. I try to make them as like the experience of watching a fiction film as possible. Though, of course, nothing is ever set up. So with Kim Longinotto, the key word that you would associate with her filmmaking style is authenticity. Right. And this is the idea that her films basically try to avoid the whole idea of performative documentary. Right. So whilst performative documentary acknowledges the fact that nothing can ever be a true presentation of reality itself, Longinotto, she, uh, she, she strives to make her films feel as authentic as possible. So she attempts to strive for cinema verite. She doesn't use a lot of the typical documentary conventions that you would be expecting. So she doesn't use voiceovers, doesn't use interviews, captions, music. It is literally just a camera pointing at something happening. It's very fly on the wall, I suppose you'd call it. All right, and again, that's, that's striving for authenticity. So little use of voiceovers, formal interviews. She said she doesn't want her films to have conclusions, but raise questions. So that's quite an interesting thing. So a good example of films that um, Longinotto would like would be something like um, Amy, the film about Amy Winehouse, in which there's no interviews. It's all archival footage. Same with Senna as well, which is brilliant. Or the, I think the documentary about Maradona called Maradona, believe it or not, um, does a similar style as well. But it's very much the idea that you make your documentary as authentic as you possibly can. Um, right. Final theory we've got to look at now is Peter Watkins. Now, this one is very, very complicated, but it's probably the most important one we're thinking about for stories we tell. Okay, so Peter Watkins, 90, a filmmaker of the 1960s, um, he, his notable works really are Culloden and The War Games. You can watch both of these on YouTube and they are both works of absolute genius. Um, but what he talked about in his documentary films is something called the monoform, right? Now, this is where it gets complicated. So, what he was referring to really was news media, okay? But you could, you could apply this to pretty much any form of media you want to, but for film, you could particularly apply this to documentary filmmaking, okay? So what Watkins talks about is the idea that what he calls the MAVM, which is the Mass Audio Visual Media, use a standard language to manipulate audience. Now, what he's talking about when he talks about standard language is the language of filmmaking, all right, the language of making media. So things like cinematography, shot types, angles, movements, mise-en-scene, editing, um, sound, performance. He says that all of that is a language, right? And that language is used to communicate ideas to us, okay? It's the idea that we will see some of these techniques used and we understand them 
based on how how used we are to seeing these things. I'll give you a couple of examples in a second to try and make it a bit more simple. Um, so it says that the monoform combines the traditional tools of the filmmaker, uh, so script and storyboard, camera framing, lighting, editing, music, sound effects, narration, into a particular process of fast-paced monolinear narrative. It uses these filming devices to maintain a power over the audience via a series of constantly changing impacts. Now, all he's basically saying with this is, we subconsciously understand how all these techniques work, right? And we understand them so much that we don't question them. So, for example, if I was to show you a piece of filmmaking that was very grainy, it was shot in black and white, people were wearing old fashioned costumes, you would make the assumption that this was set in the past without ever realizing, without ever questioning that this might not be set in the past. And that's what he's talking about. He talks about how the mass audio visual media, they understand that we don't question these things. Therefore, they will use them to basically manipulate audiences to think in the way that they want them to think. Right. That sounds quite nefarious and it is quite nefarious, to be honest, when you think about it. But it is, he's basically talking about the media's idea to be to what's the word deceive reality in a way. So it says here, the deceptive illusion of reality in parts, whether on TV or so-called documentary or fiction films, has created over the years an increasingly powerful tool of global mass manipulation with long ranging social and political consequences. So if you think about something like, I don't know, you think about the news, for example, right? You think about how the news is reported to us. Now, the news is meant to be presented to us as fact, isn't it? But if you think about the way that a news footage, a piece of news footage or a news story is cut together, you know, someone's made a decision of what to include and what not to include in that news footage. All right. Someone's chosen what bits to leave out, what bits to leave in, how much to trim a shot, how much to how to frame a shot, how to, you know, put a voiceover over a news footage. So what he's saying there is basically how can you ever believe what you are saying, what you are seeing is real or not? All right, you'll be manipulated by these techniques here that you are so used to seeing that you don't question them anymore. You just accept it. It's the same with newspapers, it's the same with pretty much any form of mass visual media, really. Now, this is quite complicated, but it's definitely something that I think is, you know, really important to think about especially when we're looking at stories we tell so a good quote here from Watkins he says my aim in filmmaking in making films is to appear to be is my aim in making films that appear to be real has been to confront the carefully cultivated myth of documentary reality in an effort to assist the public to re-examine many of the central premises behind cinema and television premises that of course extend to works of fiction which often hide hierarchical and commercial ideologies behind the mantle of entertainment and a good tale so this this bit here is really important the cultivated myth of documentary reality that's really important all right. So that's what his films are about. His films are trying to make people aware that any everything is a construction. All right. And everything has been constructed to make you respond a certain way and feel a certain way and take certain messages on board. Um, his films are about that. So he uses recreations in his films a lot to, you know, to tell us this, basically. But it all comes back to the idea of documentary reality and how can you believe the truth, essentially. All right. Is this someone's version of the truth? OK, this is probably the most important theory to look at when we're looking at stories we tell. OK, so there we go. Real nice basic summary of the monoform. So. Audiences are becoming so used to the methods of communication by the media, the media then uses the standard language to manipulate spectators. The monoform is the idea that we as a spectator are becoming so used to these techniques that we accept them blindly and do not question them. And that's the important thing. We do not question them. We accept them as the truth. And his idea is that this should be something that we need to question. All right, we need to question who is giving us these messages, why they're giving us these messages, what are they trying to achieve by giving us this message? 
Okay. Right. So that's that's it. We uh, when we just could just reiterate when we talk about standard language, we're just talking about typical film and media language. All the stuff that we're used to, all the stuff that we see every time we consume a media product, we make these connections. All right, but these are what's the word? unconscious connections, I suppose. Um, these are the examples of all the past questions by the exam that the exam used when uh, for documentary theories. So uh, explore how two documentary techniques are used in presenting the subject of your chosen film. Refer to one filmmaker's theory you studied. How far does your chosen documentary demonstrate elements of one or more filmmaker theories you have studied? And uh, discuss how the films you have studied support and or challenge one filmmaker's theory and the one from last year. How far are documentary are digital technologies important? That's the wrong one. That should be on there. That's the wrong question. Never mind. Need to change that. No, well, it doesn't matter. I'll find out at some point. Uh, anyway, so what we need to look at in class is obviously after we've watched her as we tell, is start thinking about how we can be applying these theories to the film and to what extent they're relevant or not. I would probably say three out of the four theories that we look at are very relevant to the as we tell. One of them massively relevant, uh, one of them not so much. So um, be thinking about this when you're watching the film. Um, you know, be thinking about, you know, how do they relate to the narrative? How do they relate to the style? But also, how do they relate to the actual messages of what stories we tell is actually about as well? OK, um, obviously, I think some of that stuff is quite complicated, especially the Nick Broomfield, yeah, Nick Broomfield, the Peter Watkins stuff. So if you have any more questions or you don't quite fully understand what I've gone through. Um, obviously, what I went through was quite a basic description of the monoform. We'll go into a bit more detail in class at uh, a later date. But if you do have any questions and you don't understand, uh, come and see me or Rob, send us an email or, you know, let's find us. Other than that, I'll catch you next time.